The shadow scheme was introduced by the government in the late 30s to duplicate or to uh, increase production in preparation for the war effort. Um, it could mean two things really. It could mean that existing companies were given um, the resources to build additional capacity either on site or on a different location in the country to produce, to shadow their product to increase production. But it could also mean that a product was given to a completely different company so that a separate company with the necessary experience and skills could build uh, somebody else's product to duplicate production um, for both reasons, again for increased output, but also uh, should one of the production lines be hit that there was um, a separate production line in place with the skills and the experience to build products. There was a growing concern in the mid-1930s that Britain was at a, a peril, in a sense, from the threat from, from Germany, uh, and particularly from German air power. As we know, the Nazis made great propaganda claims about the power of their air force, the Luftwaffe. Uh, subsequently, we, we understand those claims were inflated, but nevertheless, it caused grave concern in British political and military circles. Uh, and of all the potential threats that Britain faced in the 1930s, and remember Britain had an empire, uh, so there was a threat in the Far East from Japan, uh, a threat in the Mediterranean from Mussolini, uh, in, endangering British Mediterranean interests. Now those things would have required building of ships first and foremost, but the biggest threat, the biggest danger was perceived to be from German air power. And so the, uh, the clear need was to, to build a upper British air force uh, and in particular, a strategic decision was taken in 1936 uh, that uh, there had to be, a in a sense, a deterrent. And that deterrent meant building British bomber aircraft. The hope was, of course, that if Britain built sufficient air power in this particular area, that would deter Germany from launching any attacks against Britain. So the clear strategic need was to build bomber aircraft, uh, but Britain did not have basically the engineering capacity uh, to be able to switch on the building of, of uh, large numbers of, of bomber aircraft. And so uh, uh, the idea was to, to harness existing um, engineering capacity. Uh, and that meant the, uh, for, for Britain, that meant the, uh, the car industry and particularly the car industry in the West Midlands and within that Coventry was the centre. The government had decided quite early, as early as 1927, that should there be another war, then the existing aircraft industry would have to be supplemented. And while the interwar period kept a, a design and technology base going, uh, it was on very small batch orders over a variety of, of types. So as things uh, developed in other areas of industry, particularly the automotive industry, the government started to formulate the idea that maybe the productive capacity of, of the automotive industry could be harnessed to the technology from the aircraft industry. And one of the drivers for that was the idea that both aircraft and cars were moving towards metal fabrication. And while that was the initial uh, spark for the idea, in fact, it was a little bit of a, a misunderstanding because aircraft tolerances were far tighter than, than automobile tolerances. So the initial factories were, were set up with the assistance of uh, the existing motor industry and Coventry was involved because of the enthusiasm for Roots in particular to be involved in, in this. Other manufacturers in the automotive sector were more sceptical. The aircraft manufacturers themselves were again rather concerned about the uh, dilution or the entry of, of uh, other firms into their arena. Um, but the first set of factories established uh, particularly around, around Coventry to make the, uh, the, the Bristol engine were, were actually demonstrated to be very successful and that led to further thinking of a second phase and subsequently other firms that were initially sceptical became involved in production as the war progressed. It's sometimes very difficult to find out who precisely built what because a lot of the production was dispersed again or 
some of the suppliers and even internally within Coventry, for example, um, the Standard Motor Company built mosquitoes. But some of those components going in, they built just they built over a thousand mosquitoes in Coventry. And but some of the, the parts that they were built uh, at the, the Canley site in, in their, their, their factory here in Coventry, but they were assembled on the outskirts at Anstey in Coventry, which is a factory that's still standing, currently being operated by Rolls Royce. And that's where the plane flew off. Obviously, the Rolls Royce engines were supplied by Rolls Royce, um, but some of the components of, of that Mosquito would no doubt have been built by other companies here in Coventry or even their suppliers that they used traditionally used before the war because a lot of this, the, this, the, the production process was broken up and different people um, fed their parts into the production system and then final assembly at Anstey. The key factors essentially are to persuade the motor manufacturers that uh, that they will play a role essentially as a manager. So the government would finance the building of the factories. Uh, and if you are going to build a factory, therefore, where do you build the factory? Um, the, motor, the motor car manufacturers uh, had land, most of them had land adjacent to their existing plants, uh, but therefore you have to negotiate an appropriate uh, sale uh, of, the, of the land, the right price, so there was a lot of negotiation involved in that. Um, that sets up the what is known as the, the number one scheme that gets away, underway in 1937. It quickly becomes apparent that the capacity of this so-called number one scheme is going to be insufficient. So then the number two scheme comes along and there the motor manufacturers uh, suggest that uh, new in a sense, greenfield sites should be uh, should be made available. There is then a lot of discussion about precisely where these greenfield sites should be. Here you have a critical balance to strike. The whole basis of the uh, the shadow factory scheme, why it comes to Coventry, is that you have, in a, in a sense, a concentration of entrepreneurial talent, organisational skills, engineering skills, management skills within a fairly narrow geographical area. Well, the enthusiasm of, uh, of Roots in Coventry obviously uh, helped a great deal, but the Midlands was very much the centre, with, if you include Oxford, um, uh, of the automotive industry at that period. It was also the centre of the growth of light engineering between the two world wars, and it was where the skills resided that were necessary to the expansion of, of aircraft production. You know, the aircraft industry itself was, was very scattered about the country, and some some companies like Gloucester Aircraft stayed in business by manufacturing milk churns on the side and all sorts of other activities. Where within the within the West Midlands, you you had a very solid concentration of of state of the art companies within their sector, and that was very attractive. The key thing was to, uh, of course, to enlist the interest and the support of the motor manufacturers themselves. Uh, not only the motor manufacturers, but uh, the, uh, the key aircraft manufacturer. Uh, the, the, the aircraft in particular that Britain decided to, to if, in a sense, to, you know, to, to, to support was the Blenheim. Um, this uh, was, as we now know, a, a, not a particularly effective uh, aircraft, but it was the best that Britain had in the circumstances in the, in the mid-1930s. And the Blenheim was being constructed by the Bristol Aircraft uh, Company and uh, therefore how the scheme would, would inevitably have to operate was you would have to transfer the technology from the Bristol uh, Company, the aircraft company, to the motor manufacturers. So the first thing of course was to, was to enlist the support and interest and the backing of these uh, motor manufacturers. But as far as Coventry was concerned, the key, the key one really was Roots. Uh, but uh, uh, but also Rover was a significant one. Further afield, we know, of course, Austin um, was was going to be important. Um, uh, and um, but essentially, the uh, the concentration was in the in the West Midlands. Well, in the late thirties, when uh, it was becoming clear that there was a war um, coming. The car industry, of course, continued to build vehicles, um, which is obviously the natural uh, product. So they, a lot of the pre-war um, um, products were, um, were 
adjusted to wartime production. A lot of the vehicles were um, turned to, uh, to military vehicles. This could sometimes mean just regular cars being painted green and used as saloon cars, but also more specifically some of the commercial vehicles were used as military vehicles, lorries, etc. But also very specific uh, military products like armed cars were built or more fighting vehicles uh, were built by the car industry. But sometimes the companies, the car companies, were asked to do more specific um, research and development work on a product. For example, the uh, Luton, uh, Vauxhall and Luton were asked to, um, to lead a, a group of 11 companies to, to develop and build the Churchill tank. So they actually had an, an actual design input in the tank and the production of the tank, uh, apart from building it as well. Um, the Rover car company here in Coventry were asked by the government to make the Whittle jet engine producible. So they were given the contract to really uh, to, to design, to make design improvements. Well, they weren't asked to do design improvements, but they did uh, to make it production ready. And that's what they worked on for about a year before it was transferred later on to Rolls-Royce. Having identified uh, aircraft as the key need in, in, in rearmament terms, the hope is, of course, that these will never be used, but nevertheless, for the mid-1930s, it, 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 it is the bomber aircraft. And then, in the late 1930s, it is the fighter aircraft, because in the late 1930s, technology moves on. Uh, there is the development of the, of the radar system, and if you have a radar system, you can hope to actually intercept enemy bomber aircraft. Uh, you would then intercept those with a with a fighter aircraft, a fast monoplane aircraft. We know that, of course, the classic example is the Spitfire for this. Uh, but having having identified that aircraft as your key strategic need, the government has experience of the poor performance of the aircraft industry itself. So uh, the air ministry has not does not have a high level of confidence that the, air, the avian, aviation industry uh, can actually perform, can actually produce, produce the goods. Uh, there, is, there is, of course, uh, technical skills in, in, in innovation there, um, uh, creativity, design skills, but in terms of gearing up for mass production, uh, it is not the aviation industry that you would look to. Uh, hence the need to have, a, in a sense, a shadow scheme and bring in the, uh, bring in the car manufacturers. From there to there is really the old building. This was obviously the old offices on the sides for the managers and whatever. And they you can see it's a typical sort of late 30s office style uh, sort of office blocks. Um, there's the hangar. And towards the end of it, they used to um, take the aircraft out, the Hurricanes. They built ferry battles and, and um, Marco Hurricanes here. And they were then um, assembled inside this building, pushed towards the end of the building, and there was a lift that took them up to the, the next level, the platform behind the, the hangar, and that's where the, um, the airfield was, um, which is now quite funny because it's now full of buildings, but that used to be the test track for Austin. And in the centre of the test track, they had different runways. The smaller planes like the Ferry Battle and the Harker Hurricane were flown offside. And the larger planes, which were built in sections at the eastward, just behind us, were then uh, driven via the road to Elmden, Birmingham Airport. At the far side of the airfield, there was a, uh, another shadow factory for Austin where all these big aircraft, the Avro, Lancaster, and the Short Sterling, were assembled and they were flown out of uh, Birmingham to whatever their destination was. This, this particular building was built in 1937 and it was really built together with the Eastworks. They were both the extension for wartime production at Longbridge for aircraft production. And in addition to these, uh, to the flight jet and the Eastworks, they had an additional hangar over at um, 
Elmden Birmingham Airport for final assembly of the larger planes which couldn't be flown out of this small airfield um, and they were flown out of Birmingham Airport but they were r transported by road in large sections from here to, um, to the airport. So all the factories, the shadow factories, were huge, big, modern factories, which up to that point, to the late 30s, wasn't really um, the norm because the 20s and 30s wasn't necessarily a boom period in aircraft manufacturing. So a lot of the camp companies used in the 20s and 30s were quite um, small, relatively speaking, small factories. It wasn't until the late 30s that these big factories came about, which really gave them the capacity to build large volume of big aircraft so it's um, an interesting story and a lot of these factories post-war were either sold off or passed on to the people that operated them during the war and that gave them a modern um, manufacturing capacity often for in this case cars. The second group, uh, the so-called number two group that is built then in conjunction with, uh, with uh, the, the, uh, the Coventry-based manufacturers, um, here the decision is taken to locate outside of the city centre. So the classic example, if you like, is the Wrighton plant built by Roots, um, a bit two, two to three miles outside of the city centre, to the south of Coventry. Uh, actually. You know, outside of the city limits. This then, of course, raises questions about the, the local infrastructure. Uh, you have to, you can't simply create a big new factory without therefore laying in road systems, water systems, electricity systems, uh, sanitation, all of this invo is involved. You then, in a sense, um, create an entirely new set of problems. And what about the workers? Where are the workers going to live? There are schemes initially when the number two uh, group is launched in 37 to 38 to build a whole new set of houses outside of Coventry to, to house the, the migrant workers, the vast, uh, vastly expanded uh, po uh, worker, worker population that is envisaged to build these, uh, to, to, to build, to construct and to work in these factories. It's quickly realised that there aren't actually the resources to do this. And so what happens is you get hostels being established to house this influx, this massive influx of, of workers. Daimler built a lot of armed cars here in uh, Coventry, again with other groups as well involved. Um, Vauxhall built a tank, Ford built Merlin engines in, in uh, Trafford Park in Manchester, they built Universal Carriers in Dagenham and some of their other supply, pre-war suppliers and other companies around the country built uh, a lot of the uh, Universal, um, Universal Carriers. Longbridge built a lot of the K-series lorries that were used for ambulances, for lorries, uh, the famous Bedford lorry, the Bedford QL you almost see in every film. Uh, or every, as every wartime archive material is a Bedford QL because it was the box standard army lorry. The RAF, the Hurricane, the Spitfire, the Stirling, the Lancaster, the Halifax, all of those were built by the car industry. They weren't exclusively built by the car industry, that was also built by the parent company, but they were all built by the car industry. If you think of the famous military vehicles, apart from the staff cars, which are the obvious one, if you think of the universal carrier that you always see racing around in North Africa and archive footage, the Morris commercials, the Bedfords, the, the, the AACs, they were all built um, by the car industry as well. The, the, the Daimler Dingo armed car, the, the Daimler armed car, there is a lot of... Um, so 
aircraft, um, vehicles, but also weapons. The Sten gun was a lot of the, the car companies built components for the Sten gun. Thousands of jerry cans were built by the car industry. Helmets, the steel helmets were built by the car industry. Sometimes random things, shells were built by the car industry. Um, so there was a wide variety of products and um, sometimes it is interesting to see who built what. Then things happened at the factory. They camouflaged it so that if I'd been a sparrow, I wouldn't have recognized it. Every inch of glass was removed from the roof and replaced with steel. Even the cars in the park were covered up so that the glint wouldn't be seen from the air. Then they organized ARP. We formed our own firefighting squads, one of the finest fire watching systems in the country, and we stored materials for repairing bomb damage. We prepared against gas and had properly trained decontamination squads. In addition, some of us became home guards, guarding the factory day and night. I tell you, you'd think our factory was important. And it is. For inside the factory, we've switched over from peacetime to wartime just as quickly. Although we've been one of the first firms to turn over to the five-day week, we've given it up for the time being, and willingly, because most of us feel that there's ruddy important work to be done by every man jack of us. The engines we'd fitted into those peacetime cars could run a war. Anyway, they now go into the chassis of army trucks and all sorts of mobile equipment. The axles and other parts that did a good job of work before the war have been found a dozen new uses. No shiny car bodies now, but plenty of practical camouflage ones. We don't fit the same instruments as we did in peacetime, nor are the gadgets the same. But the boys fit the wartime accessories just as quickly. Well, at the beginning of the, the war, they were, they were coach builders, being a lot, building a lot of uh, products from wood. So that's how they started, making lorry bodies, uh, again, out of, of, of timber. But when the Lend-Lease Agreement came out, things changed quite dramatically. We were having a lot of stuff shipped over from America, and a lot of it was getting lost in the convoys, so they decided it was better that we made as many spares and components and complete aircraft to some extent over here. So they shipped, um, the Americans shipped a lot of uh, machine tools over here and car bodies benefited greatly from that. Huge planers and presses. And from that, they were able to press uh, aircraft components, uh, aircraft fuselage parts. And the thing that they were given that helped them most was a material called Kirksite, which is a, a soft alloy. And from that, they could make very economical press tools. Steel press tools are expensive to make but with Kirksite they could make them cheaper and turn out a great many components. They made an awful lot of bits and pieces. You probably heard the old Gracie Fields song, I make the thing of e-bobs that helped us win the war. That's what car bodies did amongst many other things. You know, the turrets that uh, the bomber aircraft had, they got a subcontract from the people who were contracted to make that. They made the frameworks for those. Um, the big Humber staff cars, they took the, the pressed steel wings from that, cut them in half, welded a bit in the middle. Trailer pumps. In London, the Auxiliary Fire Service uh, used a lot of taxi cabs and big American cars and light trucks to tow trailer pumps to, to combat the huge fires. And car bodies made a lot of the uh, bits and pieces for that. One of the things that the, the, the company made that uh, employees were very proud to speak about after the war, obviously they couldn't speak about what they were making during the war, and that was a trailer caravan for Field Marshal Montgomery. He got the idea when he was in North Africa and he captured a couple of um, caravans mounted on lorries uh, from the Italians. And after D-Day, he had commissioned a trailer caravan, which he used as, as a mobile command center. Uh, the chassis of the trailer was built by a uh, British trailer company, but car bodies built the whole body, kitted it out, fitted it out, the, and the whole, the whole lot. And again, that, that is one thing that the, the company 
re really was really proud about. The Germans um, had a remarkable set of aerial photographs of almost every industrial area in, in, in uh, England and Scotland and Wales with every building, for example, in Parkhead Forge correctly labelled. So obviously they were targets uh, uh, as much as any other area. Several factories were bombed, several here in Coventry were bombed. They have a lot of images and photographs, but it turns out it often proves that a lot of these factories were easily repaired and a lot of the machine tools were actually difficult to destroy. There were teams sent around the country who were actually specifically repaired machine tools because they were relatively easy to put back into production. You could really knock out the, uh, the electric power supply, but a, a solid lathe, for example, is difficult to destroy. So often the factories were quickly repaired or shadow, or the shadow transferred to a slightly different part of the factory and you often see that after a few weeks these factories, even if they had quite badly hit, were back into production. When the first desultory bombing started, we were, I say we, we and a half a dozen more young but Largely young apprentices and Alfredos were formed into sort of fire brigade squads to try and get bombed machinery working again. That was the number one job to get these machines going again. Not always in country, I mean I was started I was shot out with with a few others. We had a we had a, a little organisation called, I don't even know what the, the initial stand for now, MTEC. It was a group, a government group, you know, of fire brigade machine tool engineers that, that went everywhere. I mean, I, one, one, one week I'd be in Belfast, the next week I'd be in Filton, Bristol, uh, probably the next month or something like that, at Parkside Coventry, you know, and, and, and so on, you see. Keeping aircraft production machinery going. As we know, of course, in the case of Coventry, uh, the fatal, fatal raid, uh, is, is, is very, very successful at disrupting production uh, and of course creating a lot of damage and destruction and, 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 and the lives lost. But in the longer term, in the longer term, what, uh, what, is, what is found out is that it is very difficult to destroy a machine tool. Uh, and indeed, in spite of the massive bombing effort that, that the British and the American Air Forces then engage in with, with Nazi Germany, 1940, 42, 43, and of course culminating in the, in the heavy raids of 44 and 45, uh, what, we, what we find is that you can blow roofs off buildings, you can disrupt the working patterns of the, the workers, you can deprive them of sleep, uh, and indeed, of course, you can destroy the houses and, and kill, kill the workers as well. But it's very difficult to actually destroy uh, and harm uh, the, uh, the productive facilities. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, in the case of Coventry, such is the, such is the scare uh, of, the, of, the, of the raid, of the Blitz on Coventry, that the Air Ministry decides that it does indeed have to disperse production. And so uh, that decision that it all, is in a sense has always been hovering in the win wings from, the, from the, late 19, uh, the mid to late 1930s onwards, whether it is wise to uh, site production, concentrate production in, in Coventry, uh, that decision of course is actually taken to disperse production. With the HW Ward in, in Birmingham, we turned out thousands of thousands of capstan lines, which were the backbone of the ammunition and uh, a small arms business, really. My father, he'd been at the standard since before the First World War. And, uh, He'd, he'd been down to De Havilland for a few months and uh, he, he came back, you know, and I was telling him. And through his influence, 
he got me into the standard. You know? I mean, he, he was just starting up making the wing of the, the, the mosquito. Well, I'd always been good at woodwork. I know my best subject at the art school really was wood carving. And so I started there and of course there was all the production of the airspeed Oxford going on, but there were dad and two other fellas sorting the drawings out and what have you for the mud start muzzle. First thing I drew was a 500 pound bombshell. I was given the lines and said, get that onto a pressed steel paper with some dimensions and let them have a look at it because we had a, a cartridge case factory at Press Steel then, uh, building, uh, they were pressing out 25 pounder uh, shell cases and they were having a look to see whether they could do a bomb casing. But it was decided not because we hadn't got the capability of doing it in steel, whereas most of the work was in brass in the cartridge case normal stuff. When I started my apprenticeship, at the Daimler, you go through the factory, you go into the stores, you work a storeman's job for a little while, then into the production shops. I went into the several production shops, went on automatic machines, automatic lathes, for instance, and little fitting jobs and that sort of thing, ordinary lathes, apart from automatic ones, getting a general feel, I suppose, for the factory as a whole. I was a, a, I was in dentures as a tool apprentice, you see, but they all went through the machine shops then, uh, prior to going to the tool room. Well, at the standard, we were making engines, uh, aero engines. <coughs> uh, I'm talking now about the shadow factory at Fletchamstead Highway. And we were making uh, aero engines. We were making uh, engines for the Whitley, the Pegasus and uh, engines for uh, the, um, the Blenheims, Mercury, the, the smaller cylinders. Uh, and we were making the engine parts, or the completed engines, going from Freshmanstead. That was our job, aero engines. The Humber Scout car was a very noisy shop, metal cutting, uh, still being cut by flame cutters. and. Um, I think there were uh, some other uh, pressings done for uh, Alva, the Alvis spouts, uh, scout car as well, the lightweight scout car, they were a load of things. Um, later on, I had to draw some uh, bits, big plates up uh, for uh, a product called Pheasant, which was the uh, 17 pounder gun for the Desert War. And we were doing, had to do those very quickly. As the production of the uh, Oxford ran down, anybody suitable was transferred onto the, uh, the Mosquito. And uh, at the same time, they started making the fuse, like the jigs for the fuselage of the Mosquito. And, uh, in the same workshop, divided just a, a, a little way there. And, you know, th things progressed. When they'd finished the fuselage jigs, they made four, and they were in two hours, and it, and it looked like a boat builder's shop go, going down, you know, with all the planking. But when they'd finished those, they didn't do the production. They were sent away to different workshops. So, fellows who had been working on that, they came onto the, the wing as well. But I eventually uh, uh, evolved into later on, and especially uh, when I came back out of the army later on, uh, making gauges for the people in the tool room, making the, the gauges for mini cutters, uh, backing off, what they call backing off, all sorts of, as well as general gauges for the machine shops in the factory. Well, we had two big, two big shops. We had one shop with the with the engine shop where we did all the parts for the various radial engines that we were sending out to the air force. And then the other big factory up there at Preston was uh, Carburetors. 
uh, the Claudel Hobson, that was the American carburetor, and we were making those uh, carburetors. So one side was carburetors and the other side was uh, cylinders, or, or, or complete engines, aero engines. Uh, our building, I think it was, the uh, Lancaster main planes were being made. So all the pressings came from various parts in the factory and then were assembled up so that the main plane was stood up on its end <coughs> and um, welded uh, and riveted together, ready to ship up to uh, Avro. And uh, one of the jobs I did get on that was on the leading edge of the main plane we had to insert, because it was a change, a, a piece of pressing with uh, carrying uh, a metalwork device, which was in fact a bolt cutter. And this was the bolt cutter for when, if the plane flew into a, bar a barrage balloon cable, it slid along the wing, slid in, fired the bolt and chopped off the cable. So we had to fit those in in a modification. We were working 12 hours a day, 12 hours a shift, um, so it was 24 hours the factory was working. Um, they had a shop steward system um, where, where if you had a complaint you could go to the shop steward and he would look after you. Uh, and generally the whole uh, attitude um, was that we were doing a worthwhile job and they were going to look after us, which they did. They made scout cars, uh, armoured, little small mobiles, you know, nifty scout cars, not great big things. They very used, I can remember using the uh, in the desert campaign and in Europe later on. They've made a massive assembly cheek out of girders and that for the uh, the wing and then they they laid some rail lines and there were trolleys as, as the wing came out of the jig between these trolleys and as it went up the leading edge and the trailing edge and loads of things were being done and eventually it led to the, the dope shop where it, uh, you know, all, it was all the covering over it. And my job when, when they came out was fitting wing tips and between the ailerons and the flaps there was like an inspection cover and that, that had, had to be routed out a certain shape and did that and then a, an aluminium cover put on the thing. And then right up the top of the factory, fairly close to the cartridge case factory, was another very secure device. You needed a special pair of parts to get in there and we were building midget submarines. And so that down in the shop, I was uh, during my apprenticeship. I did all the various jobs, measuring and getting the bits made. Um, <clears throat> we had to do the the pressings and the <coughs> roller shape some of the things for the major submarine. Although we worked hard, nobody really objected to going because we knew that what we were doing was fin was was towards the completion of the war. And, and the final victory that we were all aiming for, that, that was a common thing, to, to, to aim for the, for the final victory. One of the features, of, and one of the interesting features of, of, of the scheme was the mobilisation of women workers. In, in Germany, that was something that was ideologically <laughs> not on the Nazi party agenda. So of course they made extensive use of, of, of drafted workers, particularly from occupied territories, and many of whom were effectively slave labor. And of course that inevitably impacted on both um, volume of production and quality of production, even setting aside any deliberate sabotage that, that, that took place. So they were very much hampered by, by, the, by their approach. Temporarily, there's a worthwhile job for women folk at the same basic rate of pay as men. A thousand women and over a thousand youths between 14 and 18 are carrying on the good work until the men come back. Women of 
picked up the work as quick as you like. And they lend a bit of colour and charm to the place. Yes, they're doing a grand job of work. And the management and the men are full of admiration for them. But we don't let them overdo it. They don't work more than 47 hours a week. And they don't work awkward shifts. We can do all that. By early 1941, the government realised that it was going to have to extend conscription to women. It had been very reluctant to do so because in the 30s and so on, um, the place of women was seen to be in the home. Um, so it really didn't want women to uh, work. But in a population as small as Great Britain's, just under 48 million at, during the Second World War, um, they realised that all um, manpower and woman power would be required for the war effort because we were, after all, fighting for our very existence. So Ernest Bevan, um, the Minister for Labour and National Service, um, required all women between the ages of 18 and 50 to um, go to the labour exchanges and uh, be put into various kinds of war work. Um, some of them had already volunteered for the armed forces, for instance, and um, in factories, munitions factories, and so on and so forth. Um, but after March 1941, if you were a woman between the ages of 18 and 50, you just didn't have a choice. You had to do war work. By the 1937 Factories Act, uh, the working week was supposed to be 48 hours, but um, in wartime that often extended to 55 hours a week, which meant that women were doing 10 hour days plus uh, five days a week, plus half day on Saturday. Um, factories were working round the clock, so you know you didn't all knock off at five or six o'clock or something. Um, it was shift work, and um, so you know, one shift finished, another arrived, and it was they were going 24 hours a day, including Sundays, bank holidays, works weeks were abolished during wartime. Um, but workers got one week off, which they were encouraged to take at home so as not to take up valuable places on the trains, which were essentially for troop movements. First of all, I went to a class to learn theory. Girls who'd been used to cutting out dress patterns before were being taught to read engineers' blueprints. After that, I learned how to use a saw for cutting metal, called a hacksaw. At first, I broke a lot of blades and got a bit discouraged. But my instructor was very patient, and I soon passed on to the aero detail fitter shop. Mary and I have just been moved to another part of the factory, handling sections of the airframe, where the work's more skilled. But it's really all important work and there's a job to suit every woman, whether you're punching out parts, helping to assemble the framework, drilling sections of it, taking the stage further in assembly, or fitting the skin fabrics. You're all building a plane and helping to put one more in the sheds ready for the boys. I worked at the uh, GEC uh, till the war broke out, because uh, it was 37 when I came to Coventry, and I worked about two years in the ordinary factories before the war began, like. And then, of course, um, we all had to do war work, so I went to the Daimler. I got a job at the Daimler. And um, I worked there ever since till the war finished. I was uh, doing engraving, engraving parts for aircraft. That's what they did at the Daimler, you know, and there was machines, and but I, I was an engraver. Parts for the planes had to be numbered, you see, and we had to engrave the numbers on. They were so immediately taken in out of necessity, but there's no argument about it. And, and we had women doing strange and quite difficult jobs sometimes. Not only in, in 
in, in, in country engineering, but as I say, you know, I mean, girls that, that had, uh, well, never seen behind the counter of a shop or anything like that, we're, we're putting Spitfires and Mosquitoes together. 80, 80 20 probably proportion women to men uh, in the in the depths of the war amazing everybody had a job to do it was a war and that was it you know and uh, yeah and there was the um, servicemen brought in deferred from their services for so long you know to work in the factories as well, uh, there was airmen come and uh, they did a job there and uh, until they were called back again. We were doing men's work as well, you see, because the, there was press work and there was um, different machines, you know, as women worked on, as well as men. We had uh, we had the entertainment in lunchtime and at that from Ensa and uh, we had the uh, squadronaires band for dancing during our lunch hour or, or our break. You know, uh, it was it was quite good really considering there was a war on. You know, everybody everybody were the same really. They, they just, uh, well, what can I say? Um, it was all right, you know. And then, of course, we we had to uh, put our heads down, like, and keep going. I think women were very enthusiastic about working because this gave them a taste of independence. It gave them their own money. Um, a lot of them, two and a half million women, um, were alone because their husbands had gone off to war in the armed forces and so on. So work alleviated the loneliness and there was great camaraderie. And of course, uh, we used to um, get the uh, sirens every every night when we were on uh, nights and we had to uh, go to the shelters. There were shelters and we were down there and and that was how it was. It was it was frightening really, you know. And then when the sirens where it was all clear, we used to go back to the job again, and uh, and we were having the uh, sirens uh, two or three times, you know. Once they cleared, then they come again, you know. We were in the shelters again, and well, women were recruited quite widely uh, into manufa manufacturing at the, and armaments at the beginning of the war, and of course that followed on from the extensive use of women in the uh, production of munitions in in the first war. But as early as 1943, which was the, the peak year of, of war production, there was talk of what they termed adjustment, which was, of course, the gradual removal of women from the workforce in order to make space for the men being demobilised from the armed services. And that, that process was really pretty much wrapped up by the end of hostilities. I think that the shadow scheme uh, undoubtedly was a success in terms of the uh, 
the, the, the weapon, if you like, that was produced. Uh, and in the case of uh, the West Midlands, um, overwhelmingly to begin with, that was the Blenheim bomber. Um, it, it, I say it was a success in a sense because a lot of the a lot of the uh, the, the the skill, the organisational skills required, and the mobilisation, if you like, in terms of the broader picture, uh, set up a number of lessons that could then be employed with the manufacture of, of, of other. Uh, armaments and the classic case here of course is the is the Spitfire so it was successful in showing what could be done the harnessing of, of private industry the building of vast new manufacturing capacity always when you engage in mass production it is a, a critical question of what particular weapon you you produce the decision uh, was taken to produce the Blenheim in the mid 1930s by the late 1930s that was obsolete it was obsolete. It is Britain's great fortune that another weapon, the Spitfire, went into mass production just at the time that it was needed, just in time. Britain produced just enough of these weapons. I think the Shadow Scheme has to be counted as a, as a success because by the end of the war, the, the Shadow plants had actually produced 45% of the heavy bombers for the RAF, as well as a significant proportion of, of the aero engines. Uh, it was a success because it, it did work. I think the, the, the understanding of the ability to create uh, a, from a greenfield site a, a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility certainly influenced post-war industry policy. And you might argue down the track even influenced uh, inward investors wanting to come and set up in the UK. The managing director, Ernest Jones, actually received a letter from the government saying that he was one of the few his car bodies was one of the few companies that weren't seen to be profiteering. And the government did tax the uh, motor industry quite heavily, but in fact, they gave him money back because they said he was one of the most honest people they dealt with. And that really set the company up for post-war production. It enabled them to do what they, they did in the 1950s and 1960s, the, the helped uh, manufacture with the taxi and with the Ford Zephyr convertibles and many other things that they, they got involved in. Well, immediately after the war, there was this big reaction. Women had to go back into the home. Um, there were even magazine articles, newspaper articles, saying women must stop wearing trousers. They, they must get back into dresses and so on. So there was that in initial reaction. And that went on throughout the 1950s, really, when you saw advertisements which had the man going off to work with his briefcase or whatever, and the woman at home with her apron on, cooking and looking after the children. And um, all that, I think, really came to an end with the 1960s and um, better education for, for women, which had been one of the legacies of the 1944 Education Act. So um, I think there was a sort of memory among women of what it had been like to be independent and they passed that on to their daughters the next generation who of course did become independent who had careers and for whom it seemed perfectly normal to do those things. The factory it, it was the Daimler again we were doing cars you know limousines and Daimler cars and I used to be in the trim shop doing the upholstery you, you carried on your, your, your career, if you like to call it that. And, uh, and I, I was never out, never out of it until, until I was 70 years old. With variations and different parts of the world, you know, uh, but always with a, a company making machine tools or pretty, producing machine tools or, or marketing machine tools or, or whatever, but it carried me right through. One of the best bits of luck I had in my life, my father got a lot of influence. Before the war finished, they started the experimental, they could see how the war was going, you know, and, and they were going to open up and so that the, there wasn't much of a delay afterwards for the car production. And they asked my father to go and run that, but he'd had enough of uh, 
you know, responsibility. But he, he, he went back in there on the bench, you see. And I say he got a lot of influence and he got me with, I mean, I was good using my hands, and, uh, but I had no experience about his experiment body making, but he got me in there. You know, and uh, I mean, I was really lucky there. Uh, well, in 1943, I volunteered for the army and I went into the army, I was in the army for four years. When I was demobbed, I went back to the demo in the tour room. And uh, one of the apprentices, when I was there, Jackie Rowe, he started a, a chicken tool drawing office, contracted out for, to get work from other people. He's always on to me to go and work for him. And I said, well, I've not been on the drawing, but it doesn't matter if you know what's the, you know, how to make things, how to, des how to design them. So I went to him. I went in the Air Force. From uh, I joined the ATC, the Air Training Corps, which we had at the Stanley Motor Company. Uh, and um, every Sunday morning we, on, we were on parade with the ATC and we were doing basic training like navigation, morse and things like this in preparation to us going into the, the Air Force. I worked on Rover and Jaguar and I even did the panels on the Rolls Royce Silver Dawn. Uh, things like that, but again, they were just complete body shells. So I decided to move, and I saw an advert in the paper and went to Aston Martin into motorising special cars. Worked on uh, the DB24, uh, the DB3, uh, and the the first lines on the the DB4, which became the DB5, uh, and. Uh, David Brown was moving the factory up to uh, Newport Pagnell, I think it was, which is a bit far north for me. And uh, I thought uh, there was an advert for somebody at MG, so I came to MG. And I stayed working on the MGA, stayed with MG right the way through, uh, design of the MGA coupe. I did the Le Mans MGA body. Uh, and did some work on the record breakers, the body shells. I did a new version of the EX213, which was the, uh, the record breaker based on the Goldie Gardner car. And uh, then, I, then came the idea of a new coupe on the MGA, but that was going to be too big a car, so we changed route completely and said new motor car and I was given the okay to do a new body shape for a new car and that's where the MG, MGB evolved. I think the legacy of, uh, of the success of the scheme uh, sits in, in more than one area. I think for, for the aircraft industry they actually inherited the, the second generation um, plants and, and you'll, you'll see that Rolls-Royce Hillington um, brought in Lancashire, which is still a major centre for BAE systems, came out of this process. And they learned an awful lot. And I think, for example, Rolls-Royce, who were initially very sceptical of the idea of mass production of, of their products, went from their sort of 48% um, um, subcontracting arrangement in Derby to a 98% in-house production at Hillingdon. And that showed them they were capable of manufacturing on that scale to the standards they wanted to achieve. I think that's underpinned their, their success right up to the, to the present day. That they could clearly differentiate between the research and development that always remained at Derby and the ability to manufacture in volume. For the government learning from it, I think they got the idea that it is possible to create skills in a location that didn't have them previously to, to transfer skills. And in the post-war period with the new town movement, with the dispersal of, of industry, not for uh, defensive reasons, but but for reasons of regional development, this underpinned the thinking for, for the new towns, for the relocation of industry, for the development of new industries in areas that hadn't had that type of industry before, which very much carried on right to the end of the 1970s. Most other factories, as, as some of the industry um, left the UK or left, for example, Coventry, um, these factories were, in the last 10 years, a lot of them were demolished. Uh, the Banner Lane factory, which used to be the Massey Ferguson factory, was a, sh a shadow factory for the Standard Motor Company. 
that a factory was demolished in the last 10 years. Um, the um, route number two shadow factory on the outskirts of Coventry at Wrighton was a Peugeot factory after the war, or it became it was by the Roots Group, Roots Group Chrysler UK, and eventually became ownership of Peugeot. And they closed their factory in the last um, 10 years as well, and it was demolished about five years ago. Browns Lane, which was the big shadow factory for um, for the Daimler company in in Coventry again, was used up till about five years ago, and um, it, it became later um, part of the um, Daimler Jaguar production, and it, it was the home of the Jaguar really for many years. Um, some of the other factories in Birmingham, Longbridge, of course, famous for the Austin um, Austin at Longbridge. Um, they in 2005, when production stopped, um, some of the wartime factories, uh, specifically built as shadow factories um, in the late 30s to support um, the war effort, uh, specifically aircraft in this case, were still in use until um, about 10 years ago. And so they're all mostly gone now. So there are some other shadow factories left um, in, the, in the aviation industry. For example, one of the big aircraft factory building Airbus wings in uh, North Wales. Broughton is, was a shadow factory built for Vickers Armstrong during the war, so it's quite interesting to see that a lot of these shadow factories, because they were large industrial complexes, that they lasted so long and really supported the, the post-war industry. And it's, it's quite amazing to think now that some of these 70-year-old factories are still, um, still being used today.